Okay, hi, I'm Dan Smola, and welcome to How I Became a Theosophist. This is a program um, coming directly out of the Henry S. Olcott Memorial Library from the Theosophical Society in America, and i um, very honored and pleased to have as our guest today Vince Hao Chin from the Philippines, author of many books um, and editor of the Mahatma Letters to AP Senate, The Chronological Sequence. So um, Vince is very busy, so I really appreciate him taking a couple minutes. Um, so um, my general question for everybody um, is, how did you become, or how did you become involved in Theosophy? How did you first? I had previously been interested in yoga and being part of a yoga group studying meditation, asanas. And one of my companions pointed to me a library in Manila where it contains all these books about this area. And I went there and that's how I found about the building, uh, found out about the building, which was the Theosophical Society with its library. It was closed and I went back another day and that's how I discovered it. Okay. Yeah. Um, now about how long ago was that? This was in 1970 or 71. 1971. So that's about, yeah, that's about 40, what? 41 years ago. Okay, okay. And, um, and then when you got into the library, uh, was there a specific book or something that caught your attention? Or, or, or did you find the first year you were reading a lot? Or did it take a while? Could you talk a little bit more about... Uh, I, I read... I started from the basics. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember anymore what books okay. I started to read. Although there was one particular book that had a tremendous impact in my life. And this was the book by J. Krishnamurti entitled Life Ahead. At the time, I was uh, still uh, a student at the University of the Philippines taking a graduate, a graduate degree in economics. Okay. And at that time, I remember I was subject to severe depression. Okay. And this librarian showed me a book. Uh, he said, have you read this? I said, no. And he says, okay, go ahead and read it. And I took it back to the to my uh, dormitory and read it. That book changed my life. Uh, I tried the things that it was suggested there about awareness. And you know, from that day on, I never got depressed anymore. I, did, I, was, uh, I became free of depression. And not only that, that's how I, I began testing the application of awareness on things like fear things like trauma, things like painful memories. And one by one, when I look at these either fears or painful memories and look at it with full awareness, unconditionally, they fade away in terms of the emotional memory. The mental, intellectual memory remains, but the emotional, uh, what, the, the scars, the wounds, the etching, emotionally, they disappear. And so it made a tremendous difference in the way I live from that time up to now. So that was one of the major impacts in my life. Um, on, on occasion, I have heard um, theosophical students say that we shouldn't, we should maybe even sort of try to transcend our emotions and our psychology mm -hmm. um, and not get too caught up in that. But it seems to be that you think addressing it directly is also important to spiritual. Not only important, but I think it's absolutely necessary. In other words, if we ignore it, what happens is that we leave a space, a, a department or a, or a corner of our psyche unattended and ignored and try to go higher. But these things tend to pull us down. When a person gets angry, when a person gets uh, becomes afraid, when a person feels hurt, these are things which would tend to draw our consciousness to, a, to an emotional level. Now, by ignoring them, we don't remove them. We just put them aside in the meantime. What I realize is that we must address them, allow them to come out, and allow them to flow, and then we become free of them. The, the most significant uh, mystical uh, bodies of, liter of mysticism um, mystical literature repeatedly refers to this that the this lower level we have to address 
cleanse it up. Mm. Not just to press, but cleanse it up. So it's purification. Okay. Otherwise, it's very hard for us to rise up because there's a natural tendency to fall down. Okay. In the mystical classic called uh, Cloud of Unknowing, mm -hmm. it says that we have to have two kinds of clouds. One that is the cloud of forgetting, which means that this, these things that make us attached to uh, objects or people, we must have a cloud such that we become impersonal and indifferent to them. Then we also enter into another cloud of unknowing, where even the mind, we will have to forgo all concepts, ideas, memories, names, and then go into the unknowing state, which is the mystical or spiritual state. Um, the dark night of the senses of uh, Saint John of the Cross, it's the same thing. But in all of these, it doesn't mean suppression, mm. but rather really cleansing. Mm. And we don't cleanse unless we confront them. Uh, it's not that easy, mm -hmm. but uh, in the in the seminars that we have been conducting, the self transformation seminars, mm -hmm. it has been found by so many people that the things that they have, the baggage that they carry mm -hmm. for years and mm -hmm. years, they could actually be free of them mm -hmm. by allowing them to 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 be looked at uh, with awareness, mm -hmm. even when they are feeling agitated mm -hmm. or angered or, or angry or hurt. They may cry, they may mm -hmm. tremble. Mm -hmm. But with awareness, these begin to flow out and mm -hmm. really disappear permanently. And so to look at them with awareness, it's probably right. going to take some deep work, probably some meditation? No. Oh, okay. It's different when it, we go to meditation. Okay. This one is more superficial, okay. but can be very strong. Okay. For example, if, uh, for example, suppose there's a person that you don't like to, you, you know, you dislike because he humiliated you 10 years ago. Okay. If you think about him, you're going to feel something. Because if he has no effect on you anymore, then it means that you will feel nothing. In other words, it's just a memory. But if you still carry something, you'll feel something on the chest mm -hmm. or on the stomach if mm -hmm. you're afraid of him, mm -hmm. or on the head if you're angry with him, okay. or on the throat if you wanted to say something to him but you didn't say it. You'll feel all of this because you just pushed a a um, a congested uh, a state of congestion in our energy system. You just pushed it and it surfaced. And at that moment when it has surfaced, that's the opportunity for it to be allowed to flow. So when it surfaces, then you feel discomfort, hard to breathe. Maybe the arms will begin to tremble or get numb. Go ahead, just be aware of all of these because it means that that held back emotional ball mm -hmm. or congestion mm -hmm. be has begun to flow. Okay. And it will. It may take 10 minutes or 30 minutes or even one hour. But as soon as it goes down to zero, meaning you're now relaxed and no more distress, no more discomfort, then it has flowed. But to test it, do it again. Think again of the same person, okay. and maybe there's some left over. Okay. Then do it again and again until, no matter in what way you think of the person, no more effect on you. The final test is when you meet the person. Mm. Do you still feel hostility, anger, resentment? And a lot of people have told me none whatsoever. In fact, what they hated, let's say, 30 minutes ago, they would say, you know, I'd like to hug him if he were here now. There's a real change in the attitude. And it's not simply about um, people who are that's friends. It can be a father, it can be a mother, it can be a brother, husband or wife. So there is a real emotional liberation on that level, which is, to, to uh, describe it, we may even say it is quite mechanical in the sense that these are energy systems, energy blockages which are locked up in our system. And like a blood vessel with a clot, we allow the clot to flow. But this is on the energy level. And it's something that anybody can experience and go through and test for themselves whether it's true or not. That's the reason why we're able to show people how to be free of phobias. And forever they lose that phobia and 
they're not afraid to, to touch snakes anymore, to go into public speaking. And this freeing of this uh, these uh, cloggings apparently is the key to our liberation from all these emotional baggages that we have. So, and you correct me as if I'm wrong, so completely honoring the physiological manifestations of the emotion and, and perhaps doing this in a safe place, thinking about whatever it is that triggers mm -hmm. and letting it trigger. Yes. Letting it trigger yes. and just watching it with, just watching it. Yes. Will... Watching, feeling, being with it. Okay. Yeah. A little bit the opposite of what we're taught <laughs> uh, in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I know that um, service work for you mm -hmm. is a primary part of your spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about it a little bit about what motivates you to do so much in the, not in the name of service, but you do so much service work and, 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 how, and has that always been your nature? Uh, you know, I recall early in my life when I was in college and even as a young theosophist, I was allergic to the word service, actually. I hardly use it. There were two words which I avoided. One is service and the other is love. <laughs> uh, but eventually I realized that I, I won't be able to recall to you the stages, but I went through certain stages when I realized that service is not about, it's not about um, it's almost not, it, it's almost like not a personal decision, but rather a recognition that something ought to be done. Suppose we come to this room and the, and the chairs are topsy-turvy and we know that this is a meeting place. There's an, a, a spontaneous tendency to want to arrange the chairs. Or if there's some, you know, something dirty, we just, we just, uh, clean it, and that's it. It's just that it's something right to do, something that should be done. If somebody fell down, you spontaneously want to help lift the person up so that you don't think, oh, they I'll do service. It's just a sense that something ought to be done. Now, in our life, we encounter certain things that we recognize are important and should be done. And if it's there in front of us, then let's just do it, do our best. And in this sense, we lose the fear, actually, of failing. Because the question of failure or success is only when there is a personal motive to it, for it. In other words, we'd like to do this project, and this is our project, and we should be successful, otherwise it will reflect on us. And so there is a personal element connected to the project. But when it is just seen that it should be done, the question of success or failure is secondary. It's mm -hmm. no longer that important mm -hmm. because it must be done even at the risk of failure mm -hmm. because it ought to be done. Probably this is what is meant by Dharma mm -hmm. in, in the East, that when you see something, as some, something that, that ought to be done, then it's, we do it regardless of the prospects of failure or success. So in the in our work in the Philippines, probably at least for myself, I speak for myself, um, this has been a basic attitude. So we've been doing many things. Some have failed, some have done well, but we go on, we experiment, we test. And uh, the key criterion is, is it something important that we should do? Is it something worth doing? In the, in, among the many things that need to be done or can be done, we need to look for priorities, important things. At the beginning, we, we did things that were not that important, but we did not realize it. For example, in our service work in the TOS. I'm going to have you pause yes. just for one second. And we're going to join up with Vince on part two.